Love Tribe. What's going on, guys? Hope you're having a great day. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, we have a really fun interview today with Bill O'Haran. He is a practicing therapist, corporate executive, and writer who uses his 32 years of sales management experience, 23 years of marriage, 15 years of counseling clients, and over 7,500 hours of meditation to help his clients better understand, change, and deepen their relationships. And today we talk about friction in relationships and how we can use this friction to wake up and become more self-aware. And we've talked about it on the show in the past, but how our relationships can be such a great mirror and catalyst for inner growth. And then through doing that, you're going to improve your relationship. So Bill gives us a lot of great personal stories from his own life and his work with clients on how we can use the friction to begin a process within ourselves of identifying the things and creating healing in order to move forward more positively. And as always, we appreciate you guys for tuning in, sharing the podcast with your friends and family, and for checking out our free 14-day happy couple challenge. Uh, You can check it out on our website. And basically, we send you an email for 14 days with simple, doable challenges to help strengthen and improve your relationship. So we've had a ton of feedback and we know you guys will will love it. So check it out and enjoy today's show. Before we jump into today's interview, we want to tell you about our online course, Spark My Relationship. Do you guys want to create more passion, improve your communication, and build a stronger, more intimate connection with your partner in less than 90 days? Yes. Sign me up. (laughs) Then you guys need to check out our online course, Spark My Relationship. It is an online course, like I mentioned, that we created with over 15 therapists and psychologists to bring you guys the strategies marriage therapists teach their clients. We talk about it on the show, relationships take work. Sometimes they function pretty easily and you coast along, but we've found the reality is, is you have to do work sometimes and to make them better, to change them so that they're more satisfying for both partners. And you've made it here. You've made it to listening to our show. So you guys probably already know that a little bit. But what you might not know are the specific tools and exercises that you need to create those lasting and positive improvements in your relationship. And like Chase said, change does not happen on its own. It takes hard work. And that's why we created the course. Spark One Relationship is designed to infuse your life and relationship with fresh passion, skills, and wisdom. And it's a self-paced journey that's perfect for turning up the heat, having some fun together, and revolutionizing your intimacy and communication. And just some tools and strategies that the course includes is to how to eliminate unhelpful old habits, develop mindful awareness to help improve your stress management, learn healthy and successful communication tools, create a deeper and more intimate bond, and strengthen your couple microculture, which you will find out what that is. Uh, in the future together. So for our listeners only, we're offering a special of $100 off the course. Visit sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock to unlock your discount. And there is a 30 day money back guarantee. So there really is no reason to not give it a try. So go to sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock for $100 off. Hey, Bill. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Bill, today we're going to talk about relationships and their friction and how we can use that friction to wake up and become more self-aware. So why don't we start by having you tell us how we can turn this seemingly negative thing of, of friction, which is inevitable, and begin to turn that into something positive. Great question. Yeah. Um, I like to say really our job in a relationship is to stand at the altar of that relationship, whether it's your boss, you know, your, your mom, your dad, but you know, you know, really, you know, your spouse, the most important relationship in your life to stand at the altar. And at that altar, the interaction is going to create emotions. I mean, that's really 
you know, I've been, I've been at this for a long time, 20 plus years. I'm using myself as the template. And in any relationship, just like the second law of thermodynamics, um, which states that two objects will interact until there is some kind of balance, some kind of equilibrium is created. And so in a relationship, my wife's going to kick up um, memories and emotions in me. And those memories and emotions have nothing to do with her. She's just the catalyst. So there's the friction. She says something, you know, she dismisses me. She gives me that, you know, evil eyebrow. And suddenly that little eight-year-old inside of Bill, inside of me, like gets kicked up, right? So I'm the 55-year-old, but that 14-year-old or that eight-year-old is getting kicked up. So the friction has created this old emotion in me. So what happens? What's the work? Well, the work of relationship like its Latin root, relatus, means to carry back. Relationships are a verb. And the friction is creating emotion in me. So I take that emotion generated at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when my wife gives me the evil eyebrow, and I do something with those emotions, those memories. I could lash back. I could shout out. I could kick the dog. I do all those kinds of things. Or the real work is take that emotion in me and go sit and meditate on it. Do, do something therapeutic and go, oh, that's my frustration from when I was in fourth grade and I watched my mom browbeat my dad when I, you know, got dropped like a hot rock in fifth grade from whatever, Liz Brown. I'm revealing my whole life. <laughs> um, in one quick response. But so the friction is simply the device. It's the mechanism. The altar of relationship is the device, the mechanism for my most, for my biggest growth. I say, where's the most friction in your life? In your marriage. Right in your in your in your primary relationship, that's going to be the highest friction. And people spend the least amount of time working on this primary relationship. Why? Because that fourth grade memory, that emotion, that sadness, that longing is probably the hardest thing any human being wants to encounter and, and go back and embrace. But when I embraced it 15, 18 years ago, I realized, wow, you know, I have these inner emotions. I picked them up from my grandparents. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter, good or bad. None of that matters. What matters is I realized, oh, that's just my wife behaving. She could probably improve that response to me, but it gave me a chance to look at the whole bouquet of what's inside of me. And that it helped me improve not only my relationship with my wife, but my understanding with my friends, my interaction with my boss. Because once we work on our own emotions and our own memories and our own sadness and our own longing, other people's stuff, we realize, oh, that's just like mine. That guy cuts me off. He's angry. He's frustrated. Probably something happened at home. That's his old fifth grader getting angry and frustrated in, the, in that 42-year-old body. Oh, and it brings us clarity. So friction, long story short, the friction is, the, is the, the mechanism, the energetic event that we use to grow up. The greatest growth in, a, in, in any human being's life is addressing that and not pointing fingers and blaming, but going inside. It's a lot of work. It's uncomfortable. There will be tears. So... Anyway, that's a long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that's great. And if you don't mind sharing, I know you said like 15, 18 years ago, it seems like you had a had a moment or, or really started to dive in. Was there a catalyst for you? And maybe that can help our listeners kind of get kick-started on this. It's it's the great story. My wife's like, really? You're going to tell that one again? So, <laughs> and, and it's such an important question. Thank you for, for asking that because it really opened my eyes and heart. You know, it's kind of like, and I quote in my book, Einstein talks about when they started splitting the atom open, they, he said this whole foundation of the rational reality of their scientific world collapsed in that moment when they realized everything was connected. And so my wife and I are about three and a half years, four years into our marriage, have two young daughters, and I was upbraiding. I was kind of correcting my daughters at the dinner table. And I could see my wife just got fired up and literally in a, in a, in a flash, she took a plate and whipped it at my head. Thank God I ducked a little bit of matrix there. And I she threw the plate at me and I, and I, I kind of just looked at her and I realized, Oh, Holy cow. She's more angry at me. It, it, it's almost impossible for her to be that angry at me having only known me for four years. Like I realized that anger had to be decades old. And it was in that moment, Chad, where I realized we carry in across the marital threshold this, this kingdom of emotions that are stored up. And it's the friction that woke it up. It was me, you know, correcting my daughters, but it kicked up something in Linda. Now, here's the, if you allow me just a few more seconds here, what happened was that I said, okay, let's do therapy. Let's go to therapy right there. So two weeks later, we're in a therapeutic session. 
And she started describing that moment in time. She described describing throwing that plate, Bill's being a jerk. And then she got quiet. And then she started saying, yeah, he was a jerk. He, he used to make me ride horses. What happened was in the therapeutic session, when she relaxed, she realized when her dad used to come to the dinner table when she was eight or nine, he used to upbraid her. He was a little bit drunk. He, he would, he was, and so she wasn't throwing the plate at me. She was throwing the plate at her deceased father. And then I like, it all opened up for me. Like all we're doing all, if you and I get into relationship, I'm going to kick up stuff in you and you're going to kick up stuff in me. I'm just the bringer of the kicker upper stuff. I'm just the catalyst. And that, that was the aha moment. I said, I, I'm going to, I'm going to follow this all the way upstream. And I, I have not stopped. I've meditated for 8,000 hours did another 45 minutes today. Um, you know, I've done a ton of research. I cite 67 different resources in the book and I'm not trying to plug the book. Just, I decided that I wanted to get to the root of it. And the root of it is everybody has this world of emotions and it's only by going inside and being with them. Do we understand what we're actually bringing to the altar of marriage, right? What is, what did I bring 10 years ago? A certain amount, but 10 years later, I bring even more because I'm more aware of myself or trying to be more aware. So that was the catalyst. It was a famous plate in the head catalyst, <laughs> which set me off into this journey that still hasn't stopped. I'm curious, did you and your wife kind of take that journey together or have you gone in separate directions or how does Great that? question. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, I guess I'd just be fully candid here, right? I mean, it's all in the book anyway. Um, we're about, so before that, plate incident, plus or minus that plate incident, I walked up to her and one day I said, listen, if we don't do therapy, it's not going to work. You know, your parents' relationship wasn't good or bad. It just didn't work that well. My parents, and eh, it's not like we have to do the work. And I said, if you don't, aren't willing to do the work, sweetheart, I love you. I just, I don't think I'm going to stick around. So the answer is 100%. She, and I almost tear up a little bit. She committed to it. And then, so we would do some work things would settle down. And then two or three years later, the stuff would pile up again. And I would kind of drag her in. What was interesting, I, I would drag her into therapy and she didn't like it because it was kicking up all this old stuff and she wouldn't talk to me for two days. So her idea of therapy was we owned a therapy and Bill and I don't talk for two days. That's uncomfortable. But she started realizing she was unwinding the spool. She was, you know, the spool was unwinding. So we absolutely took it together. Um, we had a big, big blowout, 10 years in our marriage where we just laid it all out. No, nothing held back. We had this half an hour conversation and that was the big, big catalyst where she recommitted again. But the answer is she was 100% in. She took it at a different pace. Um, and I think moms, you know, are so, um, they get so drawn, the energy gets consumed by the kids and the friends and the, and the groceries. I mean, I, I could never be a mom. Moms are the greatest human beings on the planet. No man could ever do what you guys do. And so we did it together. I did it at a different pace. Um, she was committed to it, but she, you know, there was times where she said, you know, I should probably be, you know, doing more, but it's been, it's been, you know, it's been a great journey, not an easy one. We've been through six therapists and she probably threw the big divorce at me. Like I want a divorce probably, I don't know, 80 times in 15 years. <laughs> and I just knew that those points were when she was really, really upset and felt really, really compressed and, and frustrated with her life, with her life, not so much the relationship. It's really, I guess, it's good to hear that you two both committed, even though the path looked a little bit differently, maybe that, that there's hope for maybe somebody who's listening right now that maybe thinks their partner is not on the same path as them, but it's okay. Maybe as long as they both are committed to improving and working on the relationship. It's a great point because everyone's going to do it at a different pace. I think for, I know for me, I came to a point early in the relationship where I just realized my life's going to be better with her in it. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a challenge, but she can hold the space. So the, 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 the symbol for the woman is the circle, the hoop and the symbol for the man's the line. Women create the hoop. They create the space of the hearth hearth equals heart. And so I knew she could create a space that could hold me, that could contain me, that could, that helped me grow and become the best I could. Without her, I don't think I couldn't. And so women are going to do it at a different pace. Men are going to do it at a different pace. All it takes is, are you willing to go all the way? That was really the question I asked her early on. Are you willing to go all the way? And she said, yeah. And so, you know, 
it happens at different, like you said, it happens at different tones and, and in different speeds. But if you can look your spouse in the eye and go, let's forget about the outcome. Are we willing to continue to work together and separately to make it work? And she was, and that's when, and I do a lot of couples counseling. I said, listen, this might not work. Let's forget about it working. Let's just do the work on self and carry that work on self to the altar and see what comes up then. That's really the most important thing. It's just the work. It's nonstop. It's like our tennis game, my golf game. Like it's never going to get great. It's going to continue to evolve. And I think that's a big part. That's why I like to say the word relationship is a verb. It's relatus. You're verbing, you're relating. You're challenging yourself to work on self and bringing that information to your spouse. And and through that vulnerable process, vitamin V, I call it vulnerability, through that process is the growth. And it's the most beautiful institution on the planet, you know, marriages. It changes generations. You know, you you, you work on self. You you guys have a beautiful five-year-old daughter. And the space that you're creating between the two is the space, the electromagnetic, biomagnetic space that you're creating with her, for her, is the space that she's going to carry with her inside her when you're long gone. Mm -hmm. What you do today on your relationship together and separately changes your grandkids, grandkids, grandkids. That's how big it is. It's bigger than today and tomorrow. And it's so powerful. And I tell couples, again, forget about the outcome. Do the work. Create a space, a biomagnetic space between you two that's powerful and, and, and honest and vulnerable and caring and loving and, and everything else. That's a kid. That's a space your kids are soaking in. And that's a space they're going to pass down to their kids. And that's a beautiful way to look at it. I just read a quote. I have like this daily meditation uh, journal that has quotes and it was about healing the inner child uh, in us so that we're not carrying that into the next generation. It was basically Mm -hmm. just that, how we are carrying the wounds of our parents and their parents a lot of times. And if we're able to break that cycle and maybe you can kind of dive, I know I'm talking like broadly here, but if you, if you know what I'm talking about, if you want to share like more deeply about that, I thought that's a beautiful way to look at it and, and to improve our current self and relationships with that in mind. You bring up the most important topic. The, the name of the book originally is called The Space in Between because the, 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 the first 10 years of a child's life, if you look at the science and the physiology and the biomagnetic interaction, their heart's an antenna, their skin is, is thinner and more porous. They literally absorb the world of their parents. They absorb mm-hmm. it. It's all in there. Our limbic body, our emotional body is basically set by the age of 12. 80% of what kids pick up at home from zero to 10 is nonverbal. Has nothing to do with what my dad was saying. It had to do with what my dad was feeling. Had nothing to do with what my mom was, how she was sewing. It was her sense of self. It was her sense of my dad. It's her sense of, of her father. And so kids soak all that up. And the most important thing, the inner child work if there was, if, if a human being did no work their entire life, the rest of their life on relationships, the, the only thing they would need to do is the inner child work. I do it in every single session, literally the first session. Let's go back to fourth grade. And you, the 32-year-old dialogue with the fourth grader, and you, the 55 year I was doing it yesterday with a client over the phone, 34-year-old uh, young man. And you go back to that fourth grader, all our emotions are stored in him and her. And then when we connect with that body, that emotional body that still lives inside of us, we realize, oh, that's my wife's fourth grader. That's her stuff. That's her stuff. Like, it just makes sense that inner child work is, John, John Bradshaw wrote the ground, ground sheet, the, the most important book that anybody read, Homecoming, um, Reparenting the Inner Child. It's the most powerful book. Um, you know, I would literally take my 130 books that I'm looking at right now, eliminate all of them and just read that one for the 18th time. But the inner child works the best work, in my opinion. Can you... Talk a little bit about what that might look like if you're beginning that with a client in that process. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll just use the example. No names, no names, uh, no names have changed to uh, protect the innocent. Um, there's a young man I know, um, anybody under the 50s, I consider young, I'm 56. Um, and he has this... Um, real deep frustration around what he wants to do. And, and he's, he's in this lethargic part of his life. He just can't seem to get motivated. 
and while growing up. So I said, okay, let's relax. Let's go back to fourth grade and let's tune in to see what the fourth grader has to say. And he realized that his, his parents ogred him so much to just, just work and work and play sports and work and play sports that he was never given a break. And so the fourth, fifth, sixth grader inside of him is just like, no excuses, no excuses, just plow ahead. Now the 34 year old's like, I, I need, I'm, I'm evolving. I'm trying to change. I'm trying to shift. And so what we did is we reconnected that fourth grader and the 34 year old and spent a little time going, can we work together? Can we take this kind of unbridled energy in that younger part of you, but combine it with a more maturing and thoughtful and paced older part? And I said, you know, and so I, I, that was last week. And then this week I said, he's like, I feel, I just feel more relaxed. I feel like I'm going to give myself a break. Like, like the biggest piece is going back and me, the 56 year old embracing and hanging out and spending emotional time with my fifth grader that relaxes my entire biomagnetic limbic heart. It literally relaxes the body. Now I know for listeners they're like, that's crazy. How can you go back? Well, your dreams are crazy, right? You can do anything you want in your dreams. It's a simple, simple step to reconnect with that part of you that's younger, that's loving, that's really, really understands the world, but couldn't verbalize it, couldn't communicate it, and couldn't actualize his or her's life. But now the 55-year-old is in the world and needs that energy, wants that love, wants that sadness, wants that longing so that we can combine the energetic forces. I know it sounds crazy, but when I know I'm tuned in to my 14-year-old and my 10-year-old and my 8-year-old, it's like I have other resources. It's like I have a team inside me. I can tell you, Adam, how many hours I've spent dancing with my 14-year-old and my 12-year-old. My, by the way, my 14-year-old wanted to dance. When I was 14, I wanted to dance, but I played soccer. You had to be cool. I live in Jersey. But, I, but there was an energetic desire there. So when I reconnect with that energetic desire, it completely changed my life. Literally, and I could, I could go through a couple examples, but the inner child work is tapping into that heart and soul and that desire-based child world, which is still living inside the adult, but our rational mind has shut it all down. And I think that's the most in piece is bringing it back in with you to your daily life. We started this conversation with the idea that the friction in our relationships can wake us up and become more self-aware. So to me, it's like we wouldn't necessarily be aware of these childhood wounds if we didn't get triggered by a conversation from our partner to, to begin that self-awareness process. You nailed it. That's the beautiful thing that you have no idea. I tell all these, my, my nephews got married. I got another one getting married. I'm like, listen, at 28, 29, 30, you have no idea what's going to happen. Don't worry about it. You're not supposed to know. Just know, strap yourself in. (laughs) <laughs> Things are getting heavy and, 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 and it's beautiful. And I said, it's going to be for your best growth and it's going to knock you down. You're going to, you're going to be in tears. You're going to be in joy. You're going to be, you're going to have the whole thing, but really the entire thing is you have, I mean, listen, as human beings, we're embracing the friction every single day, right? We have the discomfort. We're hungry, right? So there's discomfort. Um, you know, every single thing born into the world is created through, um, uh, uh, almost like a destructive force. You're born into this, you know, not physically born in the painful, and then you come out and you're now you're alive. Everything is friction based. The entire universe is opposites based, yin, yang, black, white. And so we're in constant friction. The, the challenge is men, mentally, psychoemotionally, we enter marriage thinking it's a blissful state because we're connected and we feel love. Absolutely 100%. But the, but, but there's work. Everything involves work. The tree right now is working to hang in there, absorb the, absorb the light, and then break through till tomorrow and just survive another day. And I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, morbid about relationships, but if we don't take on the challenge, like everything else in the universe is taking on the challenge of just being and living, then we're, 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 we're not getting the full bouquet. I mean, that's what, you know, I've got a lot of friends that have good relationships, but I'm like, why don't you do more work? Ah, it's good enough. That's fine. That's totally fine. Not me. It's not me. And it's not the people I tend to draw to me that are, you know, I want to do more, do more, sit and meditate for 15 minutes, get to that little kid inside. And when you come out, you're going to look at your wife differently. And you're going to, you're going to process that argument you had with her differently tomorrow. Let's say 
a listener is like, yeah, I'm on board. Sign me up. And, <laughs> and they're ready. They're ready to, to start this. A couple questions. Where can they begin? And then also if their partner is not really on board or is hesitant, how can they frame that or have a conversation with them? Before we continue on, we're going to take a short break to tell you about our sponsors. Voting has always been important to me because I know how lucky I am to be able to exercise my right to vote. And every eligible voter should have the same right to make their voice matter. More than 160 million projected voters cast their ballot this year, shattering records. We want to know what motivated you to participate in an election that will help us deliver a democracy where we can all thrive. We've heard from first-time voters, those who stood in line for hours, and those who were moved to tears knowing how important their vote was. If you or someone you know had trouble voting or there's any other experiences you'd like to share, let your story be heard now. Visit and still I org slash your story matters to join the fight for voting rights today. Paid for by the Leadership Conference Education Fund. Today's episode is also brought to you by Headspace. 2020 was a pretty stressful year for all of us. What if this new year you had something to help you feel less stressed and handle the ups and downs that life throws at you? Well, that is where Headspace comes in. Headspace is your daily dose of meditation in the form of guided meditations in an easy to use app. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps advancing the field of meditation and mindfulness through clinically validated research. So whatever the situation, Headspace can really help you feel better. For example, if you're feeling overwhelmed, Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation to make you feel more relaxed and at peace. And if you need some help falling asleep, Headspace has a wind-down session their members swear by. And for parents, and this is something we've recently started doing with Stella, is that Headspace even has morning meditations that you can do with your kids. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. We talk about the benefits of meditation all the time on the show and how it can truly transform yourself and help your relationship. We've been using Headspace for years now, and I can honestly say I feel significantly better when I am consistently meditating. I am more patient with Stella. I am more aware of how I communicate and speak with Chase. And it's given me real tools to better handle all the daily challenges life throws at us. Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits, 600,000 five-star reviews, and over 60 million downloads. Headspace makes it easy for you to build a life-changing meditation practice with mindfulness that works for you on your schedule anytime, anywhere. You deserve to feel happier and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash I do. That's headspace.com slash I do for a free one month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. This is the best deal offered right now. Head to headspace.com slash I do today. Great question. So the first way to start it is, um, and it's really simple, is um, let's say I would ask one of you to um, tell me a strong emotion that you felt in in the um, somewhere in your day, the last few days in your relationship. Oh, resentment, uh, frustration. Perfect. Perfect. Resentment. Let's go with resentment. That's a great one. Where in your body is that resentment? Uh, my chest, my shoulders. Geez, maybe even my thighs and my knees, resentment. Okay, perfect. Now, now you know where it is. Now I want you to go to your sacred spot, wherever that is. Everybody's got to have the chair or the cushion. I want you to find your spot. I want you to sit down with your back straight and do a couple deep breaths. I've got a little couple videos on um, on YouTube. With your back straight, a couple deep breaths, four, five, six deep breaths, and now enter the resentment phase. Go find that resentment, okay, and just be with it. Don't try to change anything. Just be in that resentment. Just be with it. Be with it. Oh, yeah. Man, he's such a jerk. She's such a jerk. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, my parents are jerks. Uh, and, and what's going to happen is we open up the bouquet of resentment that our spouse kicked up something specific, but we're going to realize there's a much bigger component to resentment. 
you know, my boss is being a jerk. I'm underpaid. My like, it, it opens up this vista of resentment. And if we do that and just commit to opening to it, don't shift anything. Don't try anything. Just open up to it. And suddenly we're in this res- resentment world and watch, you know, see what happens. Okay. Nothing happened. 10 minutes. Great. Come back tomorrow. Come back the next day. If you keep doing it, just like working out, you're not going to grow muscles day one. You keep coming back to that resentment world stored in your chest and your knees, wherever that is. One of these days, it's going to be like, oh, my God, I have this old resentment towards X, Y, Z, my dad, my mom, my grandfather. And that's the original. It's almost like the headwater. It's the top of the pyramid of the resentment thing. And now the adult 45 year old, whoever's doing this work just stays with that resentment and goes, okay, what did I learn from that resentment? This is really the, the, this is the next, this is where, this is where it gets good. What did I learn from resentment? Well, I learned that, um, you know, people need to treat people better and I should have been treated better. And you know what? That really wasn't my fault. The way I was treated, I was a fourth grader. Okay. Perfect. Ah, wait, that wasn't my fault. No, it wasn't your fault. This is kind of your inner dialogue. It's a, oh, it's not your fault. And suddenly when you realize that was theirs, that was grandma's, and this was mine, there's a little shift. There's a little energetic relief moment. And that begins a bigger, a bigger cascade. And so in summary, find the emotion, wear in the body, and sit with it. And I can't tell you how many times people go, Bill, I don't want to sit quietly alone in a, in a dimly lit room with no, no sound. I'm like, okay, that's really the only way. That and therapy are really the only two ways to get at the roots of what we're doing. So that's the trail. Go, you have to be with it to know it, let it come up, know it better, and then it starts to open up. And it just, it's like befriending an old, old experience, literally befriending resentment, talking with it, dialoguing with it, being with it, dancing with it, crying with it. And sooner or later, it just softens. Yeah, I've shared this quote before, but in a different context. But I feel like it kind of applies. But like success in life can be counted by the number of difficult conversations you have, something to that extent. But I would change that and say like the the amount of difficult conversations you have with yourself of sitting with these negative emotions and and. Because a lot of times that's the only way they're not just going to disappear. So it, it's a valuable exercise. And what is like the exact kind of thing you do when you sit down and what's the dialogue in your head? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'm, and, and thank you for letting me expound on this because this is my favorite, my favorite piece. So let's go back to that resentment thing again. So you did just to start, ideally, you start on the cushion with, okay, I'm going to find resentment. But if you're just, you know, you're sitting down at your desk, something just got kicked up in your wife. You're like, okay, I'm going to commit to doing this work. Just take a pen and write resentment. Number one, step one, write resentment. Cause that's what you're feeling. Frustration, where in the body, just identifying the body. Now you're, you're trying to kick it up. So because you're trying to raise the energy up, you need to, you need to get comfortable and kind of soften the body. And that's where you take that to, as I say, Take it to the cushion. Take it to the chair. Take your stuff to your sacred place. For me, it's my walk-in closet. It's it's powerful for me to be in there. Stuff opens up, and so now you're now you're in your spot. You're safe. Uh, it's quiet, and you feel okay by mm, just being just being with whatever comes up. Okay, so that that's that step one is to write the word down. Two is to sit down and let it bubble up. And even if it takes time, here's what I'll say. If you try this and you can't get the resentment to come up when you sit down, leave it and come back. Don't try too much. Don't try to, you know, we're not trying to, we're not trying to sledgehammer processing and, and personal growth and development and raising of consciousness. We're just trying to be with it and be soft with it. And so now you're in it. Now you're breathing into it and you're having The current resentment's kicking up. You know, my wife was really snoppy to me. She was really snarky. And God, that really made me feel uncomfortable. Oh, that's in my chest. Like I can feel right now as I talk about, oh, that's in my chest. I really feel that. So now you're just in that chest spot. Okay. Now here's here's where I add one more layer. And I'm just going to talk through it. 
And then I could certainly go deeper in terms of processing. But now you're in that resentment phase. You can feel it in your chest. The question I like to ask is which of the four relationships inside your body that are stored in your body does that most resonate with? And there's four archetypical relationships in every human being. There's the relationship to the masculine. There's the relationship to the feminine. So the relationship to the masculine is the dad energy, typically. Relationship to the feminine is the mom energy. There's our relationship to relationships. And I'm going to come back to that's a really important one for me. And then there's our relationship to self. So there we are sitting in that resentment. And, and I've done this exercise a lot. The resentments come up. And I realize for me, the archetype it most matches with is my relationship to relationships because I watched my parents, not good or bad, interact. And I resented the way some of those interactions went down. In fact, a lot of the interactions went down. So I carried this resentment and frustration towards my, my archetype of relationships living inside of me. And I realized my wife was kicking them up. And so I realize, so I go back. And so me, the 55 year old spends time with a fifth grader who has that frustration and anger that he couldn't actualize. And we just spend time with it and, and, and literally let the fifth grader go and listen, that was a, that was a perfect emotion you had. It was hundred percent perfect because it was yours. But remember now, now we're evolving. Now you and I are together and now we're in the world together and we have the ability to change things. I can change the interaction with my wife by addressing it with her. I can't change her, but I can, I can be active. And that's the key piece. The child couldn't be active. But with the child resentment, with the adult perspective, we can now move into the world and, and watch our resentment. And we can take action to shift and to avoid it, to address it, call somebody out. I couldn't call my parents out in fifth grade or sixth grade. It just That's the way life was. Sorry, that was a long, long going. So you got to get in it, figure out which of the four blocks it is. Is it, the, is it energy and resentment towards dad, towards mom, towards relationship or towards self? And then just continue to come back to that emotion until it, it will soften. It will, at least you'll be aware of it. And as Carl Jung says, the greatest thinker probably of all time, he said, the only way to change something is to accept it. But you can't accept something until you really vibrationally, biomagnetically, limbically, psychoemotionally know what it is. How do I let, how do I accept resentment? If I, if it's just a word and a thought, it's got to be an emotion. Uh, it's a super valuable quote and, and exercise there. And, and that's why it takes work because we could be feeling these negative things, but until we're able to identify it and, and accept it and then, and let it go is maybe a word. I don't know if, if you would use that, but, uh, or allow it and then, and then kind of let it go. Um, and then it's, it's not a, uh, a, a point where then you're just done. It's probably going to come up again. <laughs> you know, that's our life's work. What, you, you nailed it. And what I really try to encourage folks to do is don't let go of it too quickly because it's got so much to teach. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like your high school yearbook, you know, or your eighth grade yearbook. It's like, you know, I'll just throw it out. No, no, no. There's so much in there. And each year you come back to it, you see something else about yourself or something. Resentment will never, ever go away. It lives in the universe. It lives in all of us. It's just that what's, what's Bill's version of resentment now at 56 versus 34 when I first got married at 32, you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's a world of difference, but it's, I still got plenty of it. <laughs> um, there's just a different tone to it. And I use it in a different way. And I use it as a catalyst as opposed to a hook. I don't, I don't get hooked on my wife's dismissive behavior, who I love and embrace. And she's, you know, 50 feet away. I used to get so hooked on it because my hook about resentment towards my parents was so thick, but it's so thin now. It's like this, it's like this string that things don't really hold that well, but it's still there. Um, so that's my biggest recommendation is don't expect, see, the great thing about being human is evolution doesn't have our, our personal development, our growth, our raising conscious is not a linear process happens all the time. You guys know you get into therapy, you're like, Oh my God, I feel so much better. Three weeks later, you're 10 times, you're five times more depressed because it's opened the Pandora's box of all these old emotions. <laughs> so this is not a linear process. It's really important for people to remember that if you embrace the friction, and embrace what you're doing in relationship and looking at your relationship as one as 
I'm just going to say it. It's the most important thing in your life. The Harvard Grant study, guys, the Harvard Grant study, results came out in 2016. It was a 80-year longitudinal study. And they said all boiled down. They basically, they didn't basically, they followed the class of 41, 42, and 43 out of Harvard. And they followed these men for 80 years. Now they're studying their grandkids. They summed it up in one sentence. The most important thing in people's relationships, in, in people's lives is relationships. The most important thing in people's lives is relationships. That's Harvard. 80 years. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm good. I've, I've got that. And so know that it's not a linear process. It's going to get bumpy. If you start embracing this kind of deeper inner work, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> because now you're going to be like, oh, now it's all raw. And you're going to come at your spouse going, you good, you black, can't believe, right? And then, you know, so it's, that's the disclaimer. Inner work involves speed bumps. Just beware the speed bumps. And that's just yourself being more raw and that inner child now willing to come out. Because a lot of our inner children don't really want to come out because they're afraid because they, they didn't really have a voice then. Am I really going to create a voice for my fifth grader? Well, it took me a while, but he's, you know, he's the most important thing in my life, really. We love it, Bill. And I think this is... You know, Sorry. Bill, no, my no. My wife's like, I'm incapable of small talk. I just, I just go on and on. So <laughs> that's, that's the great. idea of the show. Yeah. Where we could talk about it all day. And, and you've given us and our listeners some great things to think about, uh, a great exercise to, to work towards healing these emotions. And uh, yeah, it's just... It is our life's work and the more tools we can have. <laughs> and you guys are doing great work. I've been on your, I, I, I was on your site for a while and you've been at it for a while and that's just so good. Thank so you. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. The world needs it. Mother earth needs it. Mother earth is calling all of us to work on self, which is the working on the relationship and the relationships are good. It means our kids will have balance, which means our kids go out into the world with balance and mother Earth's like, we need balance. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's so true. Uh, on a fundamental level, if we can heal ourselves and our relationships, it's really a beautiful thing. And, and you have helped us get a little bit closer, just yep. even if it's just a little <laughs> bit. So, so that's the idea. So Bill, before we wrap up, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you online and then we'll say goodbye. That's great. Yeah. So you can go to wholecounseling.com. So like whole foods, but whole counseling, um, dot com. That's my website. Um, uh, a month ago, I, the, the book came out after 10 years of work. It's called Waking Up Marriage, Finding Truth Inside Your Partnership. It's not really about marriage. It's about what we're talking about today is our key relationships. And I just used marriage as really the template. It, the key relationships are the means for our biggest growth. But it could be waking up boss. It could be waking up parents. It could be waking up kids. It's really about waking up self. That's all it is. It's, it's waking up self, embracing the friction. And, you know, a buddy of mine who did some editing work, he's like, Bill, that, that book's basically a 70,000 word ode to meditation. <laughs> well, what he's saying is, is that I, I mentioned it a lot and there's a ton of quotes in there. I cite 67 different sources. It's a little bit of a textbook, if you will. Um, but my whole point was, if I'm going to make a statement and I want to say how powerful a certain modality is, I want all the science behind it. I want all the folks that have done that and have kind of come before me. So Embrace the friction, work on self, carry it back, relatus, carry it back to your spouse, carry it back to your boss, carry it back to your kids. And that exercise will bring great joy. I mean, it's the greatest thing in my life is my relationship. So wonderful. Well, we'll have the link to your book as well as your website in the show notes and in the podcast description. And we really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Thank you both. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show, guys. As always, the links will be in the podcast description as well as on the show notes on our website at idopodcast.com. And while you're on our website, we hope you guys check out our free 14-day happy couple challenge. Uh, it's a challenge where we send you a daily email for 14 days with easy, doable challenges to help strengthen and improve your relationship. And it's honestly just a whole lot of fun to do with your partner. It's something new and we think you guys will really enjoy it. So check it out. And while you're on the website, there are tons of free resources as well as more information about our online course, Spark My Relationship, where our listeners can get $100 off. So check that out. You can go directly to the course website at Spark 
myrelationship.com slash unlock. And that's where you can get the $100 off. So thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you next week.